The following presentation was recorded at the 2017 ANZIC's Safety and Quality Conference. So yeah, that's the title of my talk. So um, emphasis on um, rather than activation of, of a rapid response um, by, pair, by families, it, it, my emphasis is really on um, that we should be engaging with families um, the, my project, um, called the Partner Project, was um, part of a um, NHMRC Translating Research into Practice Fellowship, so funded through the NHMRC, also funded through the ANZIX Intensive Care Foundation and the Princess Margaret Hospital Foundation. So just to, um, I guess, locate the, um, the issue that I'm going to be talking about, I'm um, in the um, rapid response system, really, um, assisting the bedside team, particularly the bedside nurse, in being able to recognize and respond to deterioration. Um, Patrick Brady and colleagues have identified some risk factors that we should really be take note of um, that include family concern, but also um, patients with high-risk therapies, which includes those pa patients who are outside of their usual um, location. So in, um, for example, um, children on high-flow oxygen therapy or children having seizures in surgical wards. So that r already ra ra raises a, a risk. Um, the early warning score, which I'll talk about a bit more in a moment, and those patients who are watchers or the gut feeling of something's not right with the patient, and um, talk a bit more about that as well later. And then communication concerns. So you can see how that brings together a lot of the issues you've been um, addressing um, at this meeting. So just a bit more about the early warning system. Of course, it is much more than the score, but there's a lot of emphasis that you've heard about it also at this meeting, that there's a lot of emphasis that goes on to the score. Um, we know that um, what's important is that there is a track and trigger system, that there is an escalation plan, that we choose a system that is sensitive and specific, and of course in the pediatric setting that there's age-specific charts and you've selected the right charts. Can't, you can't go wrong, hopefully, in EPIC, but you can go wrong with a hard copy chart. You can choose the wrong chart. Which is the best chart? Um, there's uh, some nice work from Susan Chapman and colleagues just recently um, identifying the um, best um, performance is from the bedside pews, um, but um, pews and then CUTE, which is the system that we use um, in Perth and is used in Queensland, follow on behind there. But the, the important things are that um, the more variables you have, it adds to complexity. It might aid decision making, but it does make it more complex. Whether you limit to vital signs or include static variables and, high, and other risk factors. There's um, pros and cons to using an aggregate score versus a single trigger. And the objective versus subjective criteria, um, and that, of course, includes family concern. And just pointing out on, on the left, your right there, the, um, the Q chart, um, the score does not include any of those other variables, including family concern or nurse concern. And I, I think that's a real limitation in, in our system. So um, all of those... Um, risk factors are in, in, important and um, Patrick Brady's work has um, shown an algorithm to a response to that bedside level assessment and um, in, really important to take into consideration the family concern. So the Australian approach as you know to um, involving families as um, really linking standard two and standard nine soon to become standard eight of um, uh, recognizing and responding to deterioration that there's a, a protocol or a, yeah, a protocol to allow family escalation. Um, and um, in Australia, we have a variety of different um, ways that's been implemented in the Queensland model of Ryan's rule, New South Wales between the flags, um, in Victoria, the, now the Victor charts and the process and uh, ACT have got their compass system with the care and respond early for patient safety for um, family escalation of care. And in, in WA, we've actually got two systems. We've got the between the flags in the country health, and then at the children's hospital, we have our own system, which is called um, calling for help. And that, that's the, um, the, the uh, I guess, the background to the project um, was implementing that calling for help. 
So as part of the project, did a, um, a review of the literature, and um, others have also reviewed the literature. So there's been three um, reviews um, recently, and identified a, t a total of 14 reports. None of them are from Australia of uh, evaluating the implementation of family escalation of care processes. Half of them were from in the pediatric setting. So ma mainly from the US and one from the um, UK. And um, great variation in how that, those systems have been implemented. Um, strategies used can have ranged from minimalist, which is certainly the um, experience in Perth. Um, but um, what's been reported with um, th throwing a lot of resources into implementation with education strategies, piloting, um, going as far as debriefing staff because there were concerns um, about um, the, the impact on staff. Um, the activation or calling criteria also varies greatly and that really makes it difficult to um, look at the um, compare to the Australian system where the focus is on concern about clinical deterioration in the, in certainly in many of the um, US centres it's concern about anything, concern about communication, concern about delays, concern about medication errors. So um, very much um, very heterogeneous calling criteria and the response equally then has been um, quite diverse that be a tiered response um, and perhaps maybe not a response by the medical emergency team at all. And the outcomes that have been measured have been around process about were families aware the system was in place. The number of calls, of course, and the nature of the calls, quite a bit of scrutiny into were they justified or appropriate or whether they were for clinical concern and um, the impact on staff resources. So setting the scene for my project, it was very much around translating knowledge, the policy, into practice. And we know that um, that doesn't happen um, unless you do it actively, do that in a systematic way and bridging that knowledge to practice gap is um, the focus of my project and we know from the implementation science literature that we need to do that in a systematic way to ensure that it um, has uh, uptake. So the partner project was to evaluate the calling for help system at the Children's Hospital in Perth that had been implemented the year before. So phase one was to evaluate um, or to measure what was happening um, in existing baseline data, existing um, practice, so to measure the effectiveness of the implementation that had already occurred, so um, the audits of parent awareness, um, review a patient health record to um, describe parent involvement and identify barriers and enablers by interviewing all stakeholders, so nurses and doctors were on the wards in the medical emergency team and parents and some children, then to um, revise the process and then to then evaluate that by repeating some of the data collection. So our phase one um, audit of parents was that uh, they were like single day audits over um, one month and then another month, um, four weeks apart, and um, of parents who were present with their child on the day of the audit. We had um, on the first month 80, 86 parents present and on the second month 85. And, there were 16 and then five parents who were aware of the calling for help process. So we had like a 12% awareness mean of. So we clearly found that parents didn't know about the process. The medical record review was a six month review. Now just noting that our medical emergency team response is a two tiered response. So these are for the um, uh, uh, rapid review rather than the, no, didn't include the code blues, but 62 events in six months. And the calling for help steps were five steps. So first of all, talk to the nurse at the bedside, then a nurse or doctor at the bedside, then ask to speak to the nurse in charge, then ask to speak to the doctor in charge, then say, I want to call the medical emergency team review. And then the final step, step five, is, is a number to call for the parents themselves. So um, when we reviewed the, the records, we found um, of 70% um, of um, of those met calls of the 62 events, 17% um, of the time there was documented parent concern in the eight hours preceding the met call. And in fact, um, parent concern was the trigger for the call in 8% um, of those occasions. But unsurprisingly, there were no actual calls made by parents, so that's step five. So um, in um, exploring the barriers and enablers to the system, um, identified from those parents who were 
had been concerned. So um, contacted those parents and we interviewed 13 parents and then four children who'd had an inpatient experience. They hadn't um, had a MET call themselves. And so we used a, that um, theoretical um, back, back back into the um, process of the theoretical domains framework identify most likely um, determinants of um, behavior so that's listed there on on the left the knowledge skills beliefs etc and so mapped the findings of the interviews to there and we found that mainly that, that actually all parents and children were not aware of this of the process but they felt very strongly that they would be able to call for help so that made us think um, and that they would be able to recognize help so unlike in the UK where there's been a lot of resources to help parents recognize deterioration our parents felt strongly that they didn't um, think they needed to have assistance in that they definitely could recognize deterioration and there's an example there from one of the children that um, really reinforces that they were all concerned about the overuse of resources. Um, they were concerned about their impact of their relationship with staff, um, concerned that um, some families with different backgrounds wouldn't be able to utilize the system, and they hadn't noticed the brochures and posters that had been um, um, displayed in the, in the ward areas, but that, in fact, had been very minimalist. There'd been uh, mixed messages about um, how were we going with that? We had a policy, but hadn't really been um, well publicized. And the parents and children also talked about it would be difficult to bypass that traditional hierarchical call um, escalation um, and go straight to the Met. But they all were very positive about it. And similarly, staff were also very positive. Um, so we interviewed um, and some focus groups also with ward nurses, ward doctors, and the MET um, also. So we had a lot of data there, and this is just really focusing on their um, views around the family involvement. Um, all positive about it. They needed some clarification. They were con nurses were concerned in case that they had a disagreement with parents about calling. Um, all concerned about the overuse of resources. Nurses felt they would be disappointed if, if parents actually needed to take that step. They were concerned about their, that their relationship had been inadequate with the parents. They'd had mixed messages about that the calling for help, yes, go, let's do it. And so there hadn't been an active um, communication with parents. Um, limited resources available to um, assist them with that, with brochures or posters. Um, concerned about the time it would take to talk to families. And again, Finding, thinking it's going to be hard to bypass the traditional hierarchy. So bringing together or know, knowing the barriers and the enablers there, mapping the interventions to overcome the, um, the, bar the barriers in particular and to optimize the enablers, there was um, th those strategies there in the intervention column. And so that then looked like on, the left, on, on your right there, the, the, probably the key things were to relaunch, make, do that quite publicly, um, to give staff permission to start um, and that have much, much more um, resources available, the brochures, posters, have a lot of communication. Um, use, um, use the opinion leaders to really be um, champions for the, um, the process, um, to provide audit and feedback to address the concerns about overuse of resources and tailoring for each area, which included a, a, a modified version in the emergency department short stay area. So these are just some examples of some of the strategies. So the, the brochures that were visible around uh, in the clinical areas, on the websites, um, in the Healthy WA Facebook, and then in the um, Patient Experience Week for the Health Consumers Council um, also promoted it. So in the evaluation was six months following the implementation strategies. Um, our repeat parent audit was of 72 parents present at the time of the audit, this time 25 parents were aware, so we improved to one in three parents. Um, the patient medical record review, this time in the six months, there were 174 events. Um, and um, clearly from, from the review of the record, the, that um, step one and two in particular were normal business talking to families. Um, and parent concern this time, there was a 12% record of parents were concerned prior to the calling of the MET. Um, 
and documented there were three events when parents had said, I want a call, a MET, um, I want the MET team, or I want the ICU team to come and review my child. And there was one event where the parent had made the call themselves. So evaluating that of those parents who had been in being concerned, um, 10 parents agreed to be interviewed and they interviewed 10, 10, the 10 um, and the 8 out of the 10 were aware of the system. Um, they had all been able to recognise their child's deterioration but really um, emphasised that it was actually harder to take action than it might sound on paper. They were de de had a decrease in concern about the abuse of resources, um, realising that um, the feedback it was that it wasn't um, a resource intensive um, um, process. Um, they remain concerned about their impact with of their relationship with staff and I'll talk about that on the next slide a bit more. And the health background you'd think that perhaps it would be the most vulnerable parents that would not be able to use the system but again I'll talk about it in the next slide but in fact uh, even the most experienced um, staff who are health care providers themselves would be challenged to actually take that step to overcome the, or bypass the staff's um, preferences. Um, they had been informed mainly by posters and, and, and brochures and by the PICU nurses and doctors. Um, they hadn't really noticed this stuff on the me social media and on the web page, even though we, we had done that, they hadn't seen it. Um, and of the 10 parents, four of them had been referred on to the complaint service. So they were happy with the process that the calling for help was there and it was a mechanism for them to use, but they hadn't been happy with their experience because there had been delays in escalation by the staff. It was clear that the process now was easily visible for them, but it was still hard for them to bypass that traditional hierarchy and culture. And here's just a couple of examples from the parent interviews. In those delays of escalation by, by staff, that, um, is, that one of the mums here just describing about how it, she felt like she was fighting to get what she thought she should be getting in the first place. And then this difficulty of overcoming the, the culture. So this is a, 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 a parent who is a nurse, a senior nurse with a critical care um, background, and, and you can see how she described that, but she felt very uncomfortable um, overriding the, um, the staff's um, behavior and the, the staff's um, delays in escalation. She could see what was, what was going wrong, that the right people weren't there assessing her child, but she didn't want to, to, um, to, over, to go past the, the nurses because she had a, a child who had complex um, condition, had spent spending a lot of time in hospital and was conscious of that impact on her relationship. Nurses then, I spoke this time, um, interviewed um, ward nurses only because they were the main, the main um, stakeholders in, in the escalation process. And they were positive about the process um, and talked about how talking to parents about um, their concerns was normal business. But we've, we identified there was a number of occasions when there's unintended use of the process. So they... Um, and I'll talk about that on the next slide, but there, there was a decrease then in the con about their concern about the overuse of resources. They um, identified themselves, their barriers in to escalating care. They had concerns about the, the process still. And in fact, with the time that it took to have the conversations with staff, that nurses were selective about who they spoke to, that um, they um, would um, talk to families who uh, they thought would benefit most from, the, from that knowledge, from that information. Um, it wasn't practical to tell all families, and they u did use that system to um, expedite a medical review. I'll talk about that on the next slide. So that taking, talking to parents does take a lot of time, and it's not practical in, say, like a short-stay surgical ward where there's 50 admissions and they've got a range of every one of the 10 standards um, having information to communicate to families. It's just not practical to talk to families. Um, so they're busy time pressures. So the key findings from the nurses then um, are that that communication is very time consuming so that they do have that um, decision making about telling people who need to know, uh, who they think they need to know, who they're not going to overburden with worry because if you tell a parent who's got a very healthy child about this system it could worry them and that was the, that's the nurses' views. Um, and the workarounds, so the escalation to care, uh, escalating care by um, the nurses um, was still complex and fraught with challenges and so the use of the calling for help would be that they would, in, 
encourage parents to call. So there is this way for you to call. If you're concerned, um, you should call the, for the medical review and, in, um, in fact, encourage them to do it. And, and then we had even one case where um, the nurse called that number themselves rather than calling the MET themselves. So we still have some challenges. We're implementing this um, family escalation um, process, the calling for help. It sounds good. Um, we've put quite a lot of energy and effort, particularly um, because I've been funded to do this work. But still, 35% awareness is still a low level of awareness. We found nurses do some gatekeeping, and there's an unintended use of the process because that's the underlying um, background of the complexities of the rapid response system. Families with a diverse background, you'd think that it would be the vulnerable parents who would need this system most, and we haven't even touched on those, that perhaps don't, the ones that don't speak English, um, haven't, that's been beyond the scope of the project. This culture still remains, the hierarchy and bypassing that with the MET is not um, easy to do. Nurses are time poor. And then, of course, when we move into the new hospital, when we move to the Perth Children's Hospital, we've got a huge vastly increased footprint, a different, um, different environment, and there'll be new challenges, and we do have some funding then to evaluate, evaluate it at, at the new hospital. But can we do better? Um, I guess over, over um, some time, um, particularly um, really brought home to me at the um, Chicago meeting, um, the situation awareness um, assessment, the communication and engagement, um, so d Dutch authors, and then, oh, I always really struggle to say her name, Gursk, I think it is, and her colleagues. Anyway, she presented in, in Chicago, and she's been doing this work on having um, a way for nurses to communicate their concerns that's beyond just the score. So like I mentioned at the beginning, there's so much emphasis on oh, the score. And in fact, we've got a terminology now, cuting, like the patient's cuting because their cute score is getting high. But it's about that bigger picture because it's much more than the score. And, and this uh, early warning score is, has been shown to be positively to positively predict deterioration when, when the early warning score is, is low still, so le less than five. And so of those, I hopefully you can, see, you can actually see them there, but which, which of those nine indicators do you think would be the most sensitive or the most strongly predictive? So yeah, it would be the um, change in breathing, the change in circulation, the change in mentation and then also the nurse's assessment of the patient doesn't look good. And that, I think you can't underestimate that. It has to be the clinical judgment of the nurse. Um, and then also on the, one of the nine indicators is the, pa the patient themselves is reporting they're not, they don't feel, don't feel well. So um, that gives the nurse a co a confidence and a language that they can use to be able to communicate their, their concerns and predict or, or, or pick up the patient who's deteriorating before the early warning score it gets to a point of needing to call for a MET. So just, um, um, oh, I don't think that's going to work there. Oh, here we are. Um, the, the other thing that I'm really quite excited about if I get the opportunity to look at this will be the patient and family assessment um, to really build in on that regular assessment. It's like the family, how, how do you think your child's doing on a rating scale to really force that engagement on a, on a shift by shift or an assessment by assessment. And um, Abigail Albert's um, done some work around this in the adult setting. So um, how does the patient feel they're doing? On, and so you can track that as well and really be used that data um, to include in the assessment. So it really builds on the nurse worry and family concern, which are risk, risk factors that have been identified quite um, clearly. Um, one of the high risk factors of um, how, how we really think that parents can, can add value to the rapid response system. And so in summary then, I think it really is about that engagement with families to, to, to work with them and to use their expertise and to, for nurses also to be confident in their um, assessment and communication. But in fact, you can see how the implementation of the policy is resource intensive and I'd certainly um, uh, uh, encourage you to have an have a, um, assessment of your own policy and find out whether um, families really are aware of it. But it um, really does um, draw down to that the communication and engagement should be part of normal business, that 
families making a call, counting how many calls you get is, is just completely missing the point that if families have had to call because staff aren't listening to them, then that's, that's mi miss, missed the point completely. So it should be that we're communicating and engaging with families um, on a daily basis, if not more frequently. And the escalating care is daunting not only for families but also for nurses, so it, it's not as easy as it sounds. And so this culture um, and the barriers to escalation um, remain certainly in our hospital. So I think there are some future things we can work on, particularly um, building on um, ward nurses in particular, their situation awareness skills, knowing what to be concerned about, um, using communication models to be able to effectively communicate that, how they do that, um, perhaps using that nurse worry indicator score um, as a mechanism to um, enable the confidence and assertion of nurses to be able to communicate and build in patient and family assessment as a regular part of what we do. Thank you.